to the screen, but uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. This is a, it's a great, uh, great crowd and a great place. And uh, NBI is one of my favorite uh, areas in Maine, at least for the three seasons of the year. It's my one of my favorite areas. And uh, we don't live too far from here. We live in the, in the way to Holden and Dedham area. So. And uh, again, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here, and, and I'd love to do this as, as informal as possible, so that this is kind of a break for you and for me. And, and we, you know, if you have a question, just interrupt me, and, and, and you know, I, I'll try to answer it or, or uh, do a little chit chat rather than, than do a formal presentation like, like usually I'm, I'm always doing. So, uh, anyways, I, I use Twitter quite a bit. So uh, if you're not familiar with Twitter, you know, that's another different talk. But, but Twitter is a great way to to spread information and, and that's my Twitter handle and uh, that is my, my email and uh, I have a blog that uh, is uh, pretty much about innovation technology in healthcare. So uh, I, I, every few, every couple months at least I, I, I write something and I try to, to spread the, 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 the news or the, the different articles or, or, or developments in the area of innovation technology related to, to healthcare. So I don't mix the politics or, or anything else in that blog, just pure, pure uh, interesting stuff. So, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about medicine because I'm a surgeon. And, uh, so this is the sort of the, 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 the doctor's uh, the, the, the mantra, you know, primum non nocere, first do no harm. And uh, this is a part of a talk I gave uh, recently uh, at many, uh, many TEDx year ago. And, uh, <coughs> First, do no harm, and uh, uh, despite that, you know, in, in, in the uh, United States, there's almost a half a million deaths every year due to preventable and medical errors, and, uh, and that is unacceptable. And that is happening 15 years after the, the government, the federal uh, government, uh, took steps to force hospitals to do it better and uh, prevent so many deaths related to, to preventable causes. Despite that, 15 years later, we still have that number of deaths, and that is uh, obviously unacceptable. And uh, another thing that is unacceptable is operating the wrong side of the body. I mean, you go in for you know for, for left eye surgery, and you end up getting the right eye fixed, <laughs> or uh, or you know the, the, the left arm, and you get the right arm, or your left uh, breast uh, removal, or. or biopsy and they do it on the road. So that is unacceptable. And that still happens despite all these this, uh, checklists and, and things that we put in place in the last 15 years to prevent this. That still happens about 40 times a year in the United States. And that is also obviously unacceptable. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, deficit of doctors uh, worldwide, it's a, it's, a, it's a big problem. And I'm trying to enumerate things that are, are wrong and, 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 and a problem in medicine uh, nowadays. And the deficit of doctors is one of those uh, problems. Uh, almost four million doctors deficit worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. And uh, the projection is that in the US, we'll have almost 124,000 doctors deficit in the next few years. And that added to the fact that we're having more patients, obviously, and patients are living longer and becoming older. And uh, you know, disease is becoming more common, I guess, and uh, we are adding a lot of new patients to, to the insurance programs. And I always laugh when people say that, that patients are out of, we're going to have 32 million new patients with Obamacare. Well, those patients are still there. Now the, the difference is that they're going to, someone's going to pay for their care, but they're still going to go to the hospital, and to me, it doesn't make any difference because we still need to treat them, pay or not pay, right? So, uh, but the deficit of doctors is a real problem, and training new doctors is also a, a, a real problem. The cost, uh, the, the, the expense of healthcare in the United States by the year 2009 was almost $3 trillion. That's almost 18% of the gross domestic product. And that is obviously unsustainable. And this is what costs to train a physician, a resident, a specialist physician after medical school every year. Every year, every doctor, $100,000. So usually it's about three to five year residency program. It costs between 300 to 500,000 to train one specialist. So the first area where they start cutting the cost is going to be in training new physicians and in graduating new physicians. 
And those physicians that graduate, most of them don't want to be family doctors in Bar Harbor or in Holden or Bank. <laughs> they want to be, you know, pediatric neurosurgeons in, you know, Mass General, or they want to go to, you know, UC Davis and, and be a left brain neurosurgeon. So it's very subspecialized. And that is a real problem because when you get sick, you need a, an emergency room, which is not going to be there. You need a general doctor who's not going to be there. You need a primary doctor to direct your, your health so that you don't get sick and to treat you when you do get sick. So all these are really, really big issues. It's a time bomb. It's the tip of the iceberg. It's the perfect storm now that you're a coastal people. <laughs> <laughs> so my, uh, my, my passion is uh, to talk about disrupting healthcare. That's kind of my favorite word, to disrupt this is, is good. Maybe because I'm a surgeon, I disrupt the body every day. <laughs> <laughs> Disrupted healthcare happens with, uh, in many ways, the technology, the, the smart application of technology is how you can disrupt healthcare, disrupting in a constructive manner, disrupt to make it better. And uh, this is a, a way that we disrupt medicine at least in uh, Bangor, Maine. Well, not in many places we do. I wish we could do this easier, but unfortunately we can't, so I apologize. Well, I was going to show you a video of uh, uh, technology problem. Uh, well, yeah, the, uh, I thought the clicker was going to do it. Anyway, so. Low. But anyways, this is a portable cart that has a computer with a camera, and uh, we can connect uh, via internet, <coughs> by Wi-Fi, wirelessly. We can connect now to 17 hospitals throughout Maine. Eastern Maine Medical Center covers two-thirds of the state of Maine. The area that we cover is larger than Massachusetts, Vermont, and New Hampshire together. So at any particular time, we have one doctor, at least in my group, one doctor covering all these calls, all the calls from this area. And uh, when any of those hospitals need help, they can call us by phone and then we connect by camera. And we look at their ER in the screen and we can actually drive their camera in the other hospital. We can drive it from this computer. And uh, so that helps us be in many places uh, at once and, and instantaneously. So by doing virtual medicine, virtual presence medicine or telemedicine. So helping them make better decisions and treat the patient in one way or the other, or help them, or answer questions, or make them decide whether the patient is to come to us uh, by ground or by helicopter. A helicopter ride is about ten to $14,000, by the way. Or the patient doesn't need to come at all, or the patient can just go home from the ER uh, locally. So we've been doing that for a few years, and now we've built up that network to be 17 hospitals. And uh, so uh, then we, because I'm from Venezuela, we, we connect with my family and my wife's family all the time. We connect, you know, from the phone, from the laptop. They have dinner with us, you know, via internet, by Skype. So we, how come we can't do this with, with, with this system? You know, that computer system is all pretty fancy, but it's uh, expensive and it's complicated and especially expensive. And uh, with having smartphones or even mobile devices that are not even smartphones, but just iPod, we can do the same thing. We can connect to any of these 14 hospitals nowadays and to illustrate the point, a short little video. This is a proof of point, basically. But so that doctor over there is connecting with me. I got my smartphone, and uh, the thing is, actually, this one is shorter. I edited it, so it wasn't so long. But basically, you connect with that doctor, and that doctor can tell you face to face what the problem is, and then the doctor can point the camera, you know, to the patient, or if the patient's burn or wound, or, or you can chat with the patient, or you can chat with the patient's relative. You know, if it's a kid, you can chat with the parents and tell them, you know, face to face, you know, virtually by telemedicine, what the problem is and what your recommendation is. So there is a lot of uh, intangible. The, the benefit to this, you know, the, 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 if you are a parent, having the specialist back in, you know, at the, at the, at the, at the Mecca, you know, the, the professor in Bangor, you know, to tell you the, what you think, it, I think it's very, uh, very helpful many times. So, 
we uh, started doing that, and uh, that has been pretty successful. But then, oh, and I wish we could do these videos without, but uh, then devices like Google Glass came up, you know, wearable technology. So Google Glass is uh, a, like having a smartphone in front of your eyes in this little frame. It doesn't obstruct your vision. The camera is uh, right here. The glass, the cube, the glass cube, that's why it's called Google Glass, is uh, right uh, above your right eye. And uh, if I look up, I see the screen. And uh, I can uh, wake up the screen, and you, you might see a little light in there. You know, you wake up the screen uh, without even <coughs> touching it. And uh, that is like a smartphone in there. It shows you, uh, you can take pictures, you can record video, you can tweet, you can uh, uh, text someone, you can do a, a audio, video, telemedicine-like consultation, you know, live. I can see the person on the other side of the camera on the little screen and they can see what I am seeing. They cannot see me, they can see what I am seeing. So you can imagine the potential for this to show someone, you know, in China what you want them to see by just the same perspective of your eyes, of your point of view to that person, whatever they are, as long as they have internet connectivity. So uh, to me, Glass is the, the evolution of the computing device. It's uh, uh, just that we went from, from computers that filled up a big room, you know, in the, in the, in the 50s, and 60s, and 70s, to then PCs, to laptops, to tablets, to watches, to smartphones, to then devices like this, and who knows, you know, there's already a prototype for a contact lens that has the same equivalent capabilities of Google Glass, but in a contact lens micro circuit. So, and uh, this is kind of a funny little video that I did because I have so much time free that I just... <laughs> 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 so it's kind of an illusion of how Glass uh, is. So, uh, anyways, again, it's it's a, it's a, it's a, another generation of wearable devices. Whether it's coming here to to substitute the other devices or to add up to the other you know technology, we will we'll, we'll see. But certainly, in certain disciplines like healthcare, it has a definite role that it's unstoppable. Yes, well, I think we have a question. What's the resolution? The resolution is. Uh, or you know. It's pretty good. It's about 720, I think, by. Whatever the, that number is, it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's not a HD, but it's very good. And you see some of the videos that are recorded, and the videos are not going to be nearly as good on the screen here because the projector, but they are top class. You can see them, and anything that I record there, can I, I can put it directly in a YouTube channel or in a directly. I don't have to do anything. All voice activated. So it's really, really pretty, uh, pretty phenomenal. And there's a little commercial that Google has that I'll, I'll play it for a little bit because it's, it's, it's a nice commercial. The person, this is what the person is seeing, and this is the screen that the, the user is seeing. And it's a small screen, but it's actually made so that it's the equivalent to a 28-inch screen six to eight feet away. So you think that it's tiny, but to me, it's just like I'm watching the same screen that you're watching pretty much. But the thing is that it's not like a head-mounted device, like a GoPro camera. It's similar, but except it's connected to the internet. So you can do a whole bunch of things with it, and you can also connect with someone in real time, and that person can interact with you. So if I want to record a procedure, I put a GoPro camera and I can record surgery and then make it all nice and beautiful, but I cannot interact live with anyone in regards to that procedure. So uh, the potential for this is just, is just uh, uh, unlimited by, by the imagination of the user, by the creativity. So here you, you can be recording. You can say, oh, uh, I don't want to say it, but if you say the right words, Glass start recording what you're seeing or takes a picture. And I'll show you at the end. You can Google stuff. You can search something. You can say, what's the capital of the Ukrainian? And, and you know, I tell you. It, it, it doesn't have speakers. It, the, the, the sound goes through your bone. It's bone conductivity. So I can go to Russia and then, you know, say uh, the right combination of words and say, uh, how do you say good morning in Russian? And he'll tell me. And I can say, Good morning in Russian. So it's really an amazing tool to, to tap into the human knowledge because it taps into the internet. 
So, <coughs> that's sort of what glass can do. But in healthcare, it's even more amazing because this is a video for my friend of mine in the uh, in Netherlands. And this is the view, the real view, and this is what he's seen on the actual glass screen. He goes, visits the patient, gets all the patient data automatically, gets all the vital signs and the, the data that the, patient, the, the doctor needs to know, and the patient is kind of worried about this little thing, and that, that surgeon has no clue what that thing is, so he calls his friend, well, you, you, we missed it, it's too bad. But, but he connects with video from the glass, he connects with video to a dermatologist, and the dermatologist can, can look at the wound, oh, that's, that's nothing, that's just a little, uh, you know, uh, the, Bee sting or something. So, so it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, you can show on that little screen uh, your patient list or uh, uh, any other data that you set up the glass to, or give you a, 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 a alerts in regards to the things that you should really not forget: allergies, or the patient has difficult airway, or uh, uh, things that you need to think about before you start doing surgery. You know what we call a checklist. Uh, alert you when things go wrong, or the blood pressure is low, or the oxygen levels are low. So it tells you, alerts you what 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 is something that you need to really pay attention to. Hopefully, decreasing that 440,000 number of uh, preventable deaths in, in, in healthcare. So uh, <clears throat> there's a another video that I'm going to skip. It's a, a group that it's uh, using glass to, by the way of uh, Looking at a, a, a barcode, glass can tap into the electronic medical record. And uh, imagine, rather than having, because we do, when you go to the hospital, in, in most hospitals now in the United States, you have electronic medical records. And you know, all the, the government and the hospitals are all proud of that. But it's the same thing. We, 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 it's like pen and paper. We're using medical records that are electronic, but the way we put the data in the medical record in the computer is, is by typing. And the way we, we, we look at for data, instead of looking at the pages of the chart, like before, we look at the screens. So it's really the same. And if a mistake is going to happen when you write it, a mistake is going to happen when you type it. So the electronic medical record could change to be more intuitive, to be, more, to be smart. And now that we have artificial intelligence systems uh, being developed, and, and that is now a reality, and, and what they call deep learning systems, that they, they keep learning in a way, uh, uh, the more data you give them, uh, and that's already a fact. They have this IBM Watson computer, which is already being used in a few hospitals to treat cancer in a better way, because all the amount of data that the physician needs to now process, it's impossible to process and get the same result that a computer would get in a much faster time. This computer already years ago beat Kasparov in, 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 in chess. This computer already years ago beat the two best uh, Jopardy players. So and now, a couple of years later, it's even better because technology develops exponentially and computers become smaller, better, faster, oh, yeah. have more memory, and they luckily become cheaper as well. So imagine you're in the operating room and you see this ugly tumor that you don't know what that is, and you could in theory, look at that, and uh, the glass, the internet, the IBM Watson-like system could tell you what that most likely is. Or you could send a picture or video or a live a, a, a consultation with someone who really has expertise in this type of tumors anywhere in the world. Or you could be in the middle of a trauma, and then you know, glass is telling you important information about the patient. This is a mock situation I did with a friend of mine. He's a glass explorer in Texas. He's a cardiologist. And we we're doing this practice in this uh, scenario, uh, not with a patient, but with a mannequin, a high-tech yes, mannequin. So we have this nurse friend of mine who's you know, making as if this uh, mannequin is having a lot of palpitations and tachycardia, and he doesn't know what it is. And he's asking me, and I tell him, I don't know what it is. Let's connect with my friend. And we connected my glass to his glass, and he could see what I was seeing and he can give a diagnosis of what he was. And he was in Texas, I was in Maine. So just to prove the point that doing a live consultation is really very doable, it's, it's not a... 
So, uh, and this is the same thing. So we, uh, what we did is uh, uh, for, for teaching. So this uh, nurse is uh, about to put a chest tube on this mannequin, right? To decompress the chest. Uh, and he's asking me how to do it because he doesn't remember. He hasn't done it too, 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 many, too many times. So with my glass, I'm seeing what they're showing me. He doesn't have glass, but they have this iPad and they're showing me with this camera, I'm seeing what he's seeing, and I'm, you know, I'm next door, but I could have been, you know, in, in, in Bar Harbor. And uh, then I guide him through the procedure. He's asking me, is it the fourth space or the fifth space? Or so I'm teaching him, I'm guiding him, I'm mentoring him on how to do these procedures. Imagine a surgeon that, or, or a provider that doesn't have that much experience, and you can take him through a case that is difficult because the patient cannot come to you, the patient has to be done locally or they get in trouble in the middle of an operation, they want to sort of you know, ask you, you know, what do you think about this? Should I go here or here? And then you can live talk to them and guide them through that. So the potential for telementoring, it's amazing. The potential for medical education is also amazing. And So in this one, this is the same mannequin, and I'm, this is just to prove the, the point that for medical education, so when I'm in the operating room, I have students, we have students from uh, uh, Unicom and from the University of, uh, of Vermont. We have two of them usually in the operating room, sometimes three of them, and one is helping us with the operation, and the other two are, are picking behind our shoulders, trying not to touch anything because the, the circulating nurses at the bank where they have a big you know, bamboo <laughs> stick and they hit the students <laughs> and they get too close. So, for them, imagine if they, they want to see as much, so with something like glass, which offers the same point of view, the same perspective that the actual surgeon has, it, it's an amazing. They can be sitting in the office sipping coffee and watch the, the better picture, better view than a student who is helping in the operation. So uh, because glass gives them the, the same view and they can ask questions. So they're seeing, it's almost as if they were doing the surgery with me there. Yeah. So uh, we were doing this and uh, they were asking me and I was answering questions as I was going, as if they were present, they were virtually present with me. And we'll stop here because we, we're going to have dinner pretty soon. So, so, <laughs> and, uh, so, so they can be in the next room and they were watching, in this case they were watching on a, on a on a small screen, you know, in an iPad screen. They were actually on the next door room watching that procedure that, that the nurse was doing. So they could talk, they could interact. So it's not a recording, it's a live event. And then this one is a, a recording. I, I did the first surgery with glass in the operating room, the, the first time ever time, the, the, the time that was ever done. And uh, basically what I did is, uh, is uh, set up an account so I could stream the procedure to myself, to an iPad that I had in the next room, and I had a couple of students there watching live what the procedure, what the surgery was being done. And uh, you know, we asked permission from the patient and the family, and, and basically did that. And, uh, and it wasn't a big deal, and then I, I, I wrote about this, I wrote a, a blog about this, and a friend of mine asked me to see if he could you know, write a, a a friend of mine who happens to, to work for Forbes magazine, so he wrote something and an hour later he called me and he said he had 25,000 hits. Because everyone was crazy about Google Glass and, 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 and medicine and the first time he ever done his surgery. So an hour later he called me again and it was 50,000 hits. And then from then on it's been just a crazy, you know, excitement about the possibilities for something like Google Glass in surgery. Imagine paramedics having a device like this and being able to connect with the ED, you know, showing to the ED doctor or to the older, the senior paramedic, you know, the same view that you are seeing, maybe recording this for, 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 for legal purposes or for, for, for data, uh, for, for performance improvement pro purposes. So again, the potential is, is, is amazing. So technology can help, but the technology helps once 
um, you know, the idea behind the use of the technology is, 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 is disrupted. I think that it, it's the idea really that makes the change, not the technology itself, but how to use the technology. Yes, About how long have you had the Google Glass? I have had Glass since uh, a early June of last year. I got it a little pretty early because uh, I kept uh, I kept uh, talking to some people in Google. I wanted to have this big conference in Paris uh, that talks about digital medicine and uh, about uh, e-patients or digital patients. And I wanted to bring Glass with me. So in the beginning of June, I, I, I did the first medical conference with Google Glass. And I didn't even know. I had I went to New York, picked up the glass, and next morning I went to Paris. And I had him on, and I had no clue even how to use him. But people went crazy anyways. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, but I want to show you this real quick. Hopefully we can do this. So now I'm, I'm connecting the glass by Bluetooth to my tablet, and uh, and you can see exactly what I am seeing. So and if I say, okay, glass, take a picture. So glass will take a picture. Oh, let's say, uh, okay, glass, record a video. Sometimes it doesn't work if the uh, network is not strong enough. If the voice doesn't work, and also we have we have a, a quite a bit of noise downstairs, but if I record a video, I can record a video of, uh, and we can do it by voice. Obviously, it's very slow here because to me it's not slow, but to you it is because it has to go through three points to record the video, right? But uh, you can uh, then play your video, or you can put it in YouTube. <laughs> or you can send it to your mother, or to your son, <laughs> or uh, whatever you need to do with that video. And even here, the quality is not bad. But to me, the quality is very clear. If you watch it in a computer, in a, in a, in a good you know, resolution, the, the, the resolution is, is very, very good. So, uh, but you can uh, take a picture, record a video, you can uh, send someone a message, you know, a text message. If it's tethered to your phone, you can get directions as you, as you are walking or hiking or whatnot. As long as you have either Wi-Fi or, or a cellular connectivity. And this is a little slow. When I do it, it's very fast, but it takes time to get. You can call someone. You can video call someone. So it, it just there's a, a delay there because of the screen. You can, uh, this is a, a, a app that we have for, for surgery, and uh, this is someone, uh, someone in Seattle created this for me a, a few days ago. So, and uh, he, so right before starting the surgery, we do this checklist, right? And uh, this is a fun part. By blinking, you go to the next one. <laughs> so you don't even have to say anything. So it's really, uh, the blinking has to be calibrated, and I haven't done that, but. By blinking, it goes to the next one. And if you double blink, it goes up. So anyway, it's just fun stuff. And, uh, but other possibilities are, for example, translating. There's another app. And they're creating apps and apps and apps and apps for this. There's an app that is for translation. So if you look at a... Uh, a, uh, a phrase in about five or six languages. It will try. You have a stopwatch. You will uh, translate. You can listen to music and it tell you what music it is and show you the the, 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 the the video or the CD or you can buy it on the internet if you want just by by listening. It's really scary. You have a compass. You can translate and uh, translate works. Very good. It doesn't translate a full book, but you can translate it from Spanish to English. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. Um, French to English, or you know, German or Russian. It's about five or six languages. So it's just amazing stuff. Follow me. I think. How do you hear again? Can you explain 
It goes, uh, it, it's by bone conductivity. So the, the, the ear has three parts, the internal, the, me, the middle, and the, the external ear that, that we all see. But it's really the, the middle and the internal ear that, so by the bone conductivity of the, of the sound waves, it, you hear. Actually, in fact, if I, if I close my ear canal, excluding my external ear, then I'll hear even better. So I have no noise, no, no background noise. And it sounds normal. Pardon? And the sound is normal. Oh, it's just like regular sound. Yeah, it's better than it's better than regular sound because yeah, it, it goes through bone conduction. Your other eye doesn't interfere. Not really. The brain kind of kind of shuts that eye off. Okay. Can you can you give it verbal commands or do you have to reach up there? And, you know? No. Sometimes you, you do. Or sometimes you verbal commands. You, you, we have noise downstairs, so it's a little. But uh, yeah, you can uh, you can pretty much. Uh, they give her what commands. Glass, take a picture. You see, if you say glass, you, know, you have to say, okay, glass, take a picture. <laughs> but does it talk back to you the way Siri does? It, it, it does for, for certain applications, yes. Yeah. And if I play music, then it'll play music, you know, through my bones. So, uh, <laughs> it, it's, you know, Because it does work on your right eye. Can you get one for your left eye? Not yet. They're thinking about that because some people is uh, most people is right eye dominant, but uh, it, it, they uh, they say that uh, it, it'll come. Now they have frames for people who have prescription glasses, and you can have the glass cube in front of your prescription glasses. It's actually covered by insurance now. They they so it's it's really uh, it's a up till now all equipment used in medical is three to four times the price it would be on the market otherwise. Yeah. Are we breaking through now with the iPhone and these glasses? Can they be used medically without paying twice or three times for the same item that I can buy in a store? Well, this is not a medical device yet, uh, so they're not even for sale to the public yet. But My, my uh, point is you're making a nice breakthrough here in terms of expense. I think so. I, I think that that's the beauty that a, a device that was created for play and for silly things yeah now can potentially improve health care or save a life. In, in the hospital, the little computers on the little stands are about five times the price I get one of the store. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Without the stand. Yeah, that's why we have that $2.7 trillion right. expense, you know, in, in 2009. <laughs> Just because of that stuff, that doesn't make any sense. And even those uh, systems that we use for telemedicine are very expensive. And they're good, and this is not a substitution to those systems. Nowadays, when I'm on call, I can be anywhere in the hospital. We have to stay in-house. I can be in the ICU or operating or taking a nap or eating or in the bathroom. Anyway, I get a call on my beeper, and uh, Holton Hospital wants to talk to you about a, a gunshot wound to the chest, and they want to connect by telemedicine. Before, I had to go to the telemedicine station and log in in that expensive computer system. Now, I can just pick up my phone and just tap, tap, and I'm connected with them, and I can, from my smartphone, I can actually control their camera and look at the patient and move around the room. So, and this is only within the last couple of years. So imagine what's coming, you know, you know, it's all exponential. So imagine what's coming, and this costs, uh, you know, an iPhone is, is $400. You can do it from an iPod, and that's why my first step, the TEDx said, talk was called the uh, uh, iPod Teletrauma. The $229, million square foot trauma room. Because if it was $229, the, the cost of an iPod. If it breaks, you just get another one, basically. If that computer breaks, you know, that, that's pretty expensive. And I think that's all I have uh, for, uh, for slides, but I'd love to ask some more questions. Yes? Can you comment on how you think that this may change the uh, roles of Doctors and other health professionals. I mean, you think there'll be more sort of centralized doctors and dealing with people in yeah. exterior places who are not doctors? Maybe. Not Did everyone hear the question? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. How how a device like this or this sort of thinking could, could change the, the the role of doctors or providers? And I think it will definitely change. We know that we're going to have imminently we're going to have critical yes. deficit of specialists. Oh, okay. And uh, I think the devices that allow you to, no, to virtually be anywhere very fast and very inexpensive, I think that will, will be the norm. 
I think I can, I, mean, I can foresee doctors, and now that happens. Some hospitals will have doctors on call for telemedicine. We have bunkers, we have, for example, we have EICUs, we have doctors in Eastern Maine who have a very a strong program for EICU, and other hospitals in the nation have it as well, where you have doctors in a bunker, in a, in a room there with 20 screens monitoring 20 ICUs, and a bunch of computers and software that alert you when things are going wrong, and if there's a problem, you can just focus the camera on the patient in the ICU 100 miles away, and there's a nurse there, and if there's a problem, they can call the doctor there, who, who might be you know, somewhere else, or might be a, a 15 minutes from the hospital, but it's not a substitution. It's a supplement to what we have. And most patients don't need a doctor. 80% of the office visits, for example, and that, that is a fact, don't require physical touch. So, and you all know, when you go to the doctor's office, you have to drive to, let's say, Bangor uh, uh, during the winter storm to, to look at a wound, and they look at you and, yeah, that looks good, come back in two weeks. <laughs> so that doesn't make any sense. So 80% of the visits do not require physical touch. And uh, so having telemedicine clinics for dermatology, for psychiatry, for neurology, for telestroke, and maybe not having the initial visit, or all the visits, but some of the visits by telemedicine. It, it's already happening, and the hospitals that don't embrace this will just fall behind. And, uh, uh, you know, why am I going to go to Bangor when I can connect with the doctor in uh, 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 Mass General, you know? Yes? Based on that question right there, I was wondering if you ever think that if, when patients get these Google Glass, they can just send a picture of their own wound and they don't even yeah. come in anymore. Absolutely, and, and you know, it's not just the providers using the Google Glass or the wearable technology is the patient. Imagine a patient that can be recording, you know, the, the, you, know you sit down face to face and uh, you both have glass or a device that is wearable that is recording and uh, the visit, you know, is recorded and the patient goes and shows, you know, the, 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 the relative who couldn't come to the office visit or, or himself or herself, you know, to remind what the steps were. Or a, you could be maybe streaming an image to the patient while you're talking to them, a diagram, and talking about the same diagram that you cannot see but in the screen. So the potential really is it's unlimited. People say initially that this was a, a break of privacy and, you know, same thing happened with smartphones. You know, people say, oh, the people is going to have smartphones in the bathroom. Yes. I wouldn't have a smartphone in the bathroom. I mean, <laughs> so the same thing with this. Uh, you know, in the airports, in bars, in, you know, it, it's all a change of culture that will definitely happen because this is the next step. There's no reason why this is not going to be the next step. And why are you going to be like this, you know, on your, on your cell phone, when you can be dictating the next you know? Uh, doing something else and not having to speak. Especially if you have fat fingers like I do. So sure. it's, uh, it's something, but, but I wanted to see one more, more thing before I forget. The other, the other negative uh, comment or, 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 or think about glass when we first started a few months ago, uh, doctors are going to be like cyborgs. I don't want my doctor being distracted with the internet or operating and surfing the internet when he's operating. You know, no one's going to do that. That, that. that won't make any sense. We, we, we're not watching a video on the screen when we're operating. Or, or, uh, and it doesn't depersonalize medicine. It's actually the opposite. I have a video. I couldn't bring that video. I've been making it for the last uh, week of uh, three scenarios. We have me with a patient, and I'm basically talking to the patient it, 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 like we did before medical records were all electronic, you know? You sit down, you look at the patient, and you, you maybe write a little note, and, and you, you examine the patient, you're face to face. And then electronic medical records came, came up, and all the data needs to be put into the system or gathered from the system. So you sit down in your, in your computer, the patient is there, yes, Mr. Smith, yeah. Uh -huh. And how many days have you had it? It's like that. They face you, sometimes they even give you, you know, they're, they're, they're turned completely. So that is unacceptable. Now then we have portable computers and they have a laptop and they're, you know, yes, uh, yes, you know, and you don't. Then they have a, a, a tablet and they're doing the same thing on a tablet. Or they're on a smartphone on a little tablet doing the same thing. With glass, you actually, again, personalize the medicine. You create that face-to-face, -face, the eye-to-eye -eye contact, where I can see, you know, sir, you, I can see that your hemoglobin this morning was low. And, uh, you know, I'm going to order another hemoglobin. And I just have to look up, and I don't have to even turn around. So patients will like that better, I think, because I like it better.
I, I think I could re prevent uh, wrong site operations for, for just a dollar per patient. You think so? Yes. Magic marker. <laughs> we, we, we use it already. Use magic, magic marker. marker. Oh, no, we use it already. But that's the thing. And despite the fact, you see what happens for the last few years in the whole country, at East Germain included. If I'm going to do a surgery, sometimes even for, for an organ that is only one-sided, you still have to mark the patient. Doesn't make any sense. I mean, gallbladder, you get to mark the right. The gallbladder is only here. It's not here. You still have to go. And despite that, despite the fact that you have to go there and you cannot make an X, you have to put your initials so that it's not the patient who may put an X. No, you do your initials right before surgery. And despite that, we still have 40 cases of wrong side surgery in the United States every week. Every week? Every week. Why do you think that is? Because the systems are not smart. The medical records, the electronic records, the nurse who, or the provider or the physician who, who wrote in the computer that is a right a, a lumpectomy in the breast, a, maybe so it was an R and it was actually an L. And then that R that is right was read by the guy who booked the surgery. And the guy who booked the surgery then prints a note and the note says right. So at the end, and the doctor has four cases that day and he says right and he's right and he cannot check the whole record yeah. and someone tells right and okay let's do the checklist we're doing a right lumpectomy and then he goes and it was to begin with wrong because the humans are inputting the data so if we could have a way that Google Now, if you're familiar with Google Now, Google Now is an application from Google that it's in any smartphone, even an iPhone and uh, if, you, if I book a ticket uh, to go to New York and it tells me the date of the actual flight, I'll get a reminder. I don't have to do anything, I get a reminder. And when I get to the airport, because it's got a GPS built in, it'll tell me you know, which gate I'm going to. And if I, it happened to me a few weeks ago, I was walking to, a few months ago, I was running to my gate to go to Washington DC. I was in uh, Philadelphia, I think. And I was, I got an alert. It said, you change, you, your gate has changed. I turn around and turn around. So if you could have the same system for medical, you know, for medical uh, purposes, if you could have, you know, the system tell you that you're doing it right, and because the system knows that the biopsy that you did was on the right side because it connects all the dots, because it has artificial intelligence, then you could cut that number to to to, to a lesser number. So it's never going to be zero. Work, really. I'm sorry. Time mode doesn't work. In some cases. In some cases it doesn't. And I think that once we get the humans, the, 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 for certain things, the more we get humans out of the equation, the safer we will be. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not saying that I'm all for, for the human touch and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm Latin, so I hug my patients and hug them and yeah, they love that. And I love that too. But, you know, this is to, to make things run better and more efficiently. And I'm not saying they humanize medicine, but for some things like data, flow, you need to do it. Because the data, I cannot go gather data. The data has to come to me. The right data has to come to me so that it makes me make better decisions, take better decisions. Yes, sir. Do you see problems in the future for the use of this uh, and being able to have access to a patient's private data in a master database? Absolutely, yeah, and that's one of the big things, you know, HIPAA, you know, the, 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 the federal uh, privacy uh, law uh, is very tight. And it's a set of 19 criteria that hospitals are terrified because the fines are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you can lose your accreditation. So anything is hackable, as you know. Anything, it, it, nothing is 100% private. If anyone wants, one of those... 14-year-old kids in Slovakia want to break into your account, they'll do it. <laughs> but I think that uh, something like this now is not HIPAA compliant. It's not approved to be used in medicine. And that's why we haven't been, that's why I have been doing this on mannequins. And I'm, I haven't used them in clinical patients yet because the hospital is terrified that we're going to have a break and, and we're going to have a violation of privacy. But you know, I have a good friend in Paris. Uh, her name is Denise Silver. She organizes a big conference about e-patients, about digital patients. And uh, she has a good phrase that I love. I better be cured than secure. And you have to, when, 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 when privacy concerns obstruct your care, I think that you need to be concerned about it. 
So there is a good balance. You have to do everything you can to protect the information, but don't slow the progress because you are so concerned about privacy that you, you stay in the Stone Age. Better cure than secure, I think. In Canada, I do software for clinics in Canada, and they run into a serious problem with this database. That, uh, yeah. Number one, that the, most of the hospitals have sold out to a large company in the U.S. to handle the database, and their the U.S. is holding it as private, yeah. and that nobody else in the clinics can't get access to it. The doctors in the clinics can't. They have to be in the hospital. Yeah, it's, it's a... It's a, it's and a that, it's an obstacle many times. It's a massive, that's a straight existence. Yeah. I just wondered if you felt naked when you took your glasses off. Not really, not really. I, I use them. I mean, how often do you have them? I have them uh, frequently when I'm, because I'm not using it with patients now. I use it a lot when I'm doing, uh, you know, proof of point uh, scenarios and, and, uh, and uh, 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 programming them with the help of real smart programmers and smart people who know how to program. I just use them and have the idea how to use it, but I have no clue about how to make this happen, you know, this cool stuff. So as a trauma, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, please. No. Well, as a trauma surgeon, are you worried when glass comes on the market that people will be driving their cars? You know, I, I, I was, and I, I've always uh, blogged and on the internet uh, <coughs> told people, you know, do, do not, you know, you shouldn't be doing nothing but driving when you are driving. But if you think about this, people say, well, it's certainly better than taxiing. Absolutely, it's better than taxiing and better than, you know, picking up something that you dropped in the, you know, under the glove compartment or, or, but it's equivalent to looking at your mirror, really, like if you, at your rear view mirror, you know, because the, the, if you think about it, the, 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 the yeah. mirror is there and you do that and you're looking, you know, to both mirrors and there. So, but I think that you shouldn't be using them when you're driving. You should be only driving when you're driving. So I'm, I'm very concerned in, in, in that sense. Raphael, there's a question right here. Yes. Oh, it's more of an observation, but sort of a question too. And you've been addressing it recently. And that is a huge shift that I've noticed in the bedside manner issues. Um, so I've been hospitalized a lot in the last six months. And I want to see the monitor and know what's going on, but not all patients do. And many doctors are reluctant to show them the monitor. And I I just think that there's gonna be a lot of retraining. And they tried to turn the monitor away from me and thought I'd relax. No, 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 I want to see it. And I want to watch my cardiac catheterization. And you know, I want to see it. And doctors aren't trained for that. So. Well, I think it's a, it's a culture change, it, it, it's a shift, and, and, and the things will happen. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't have Google Glass, or well, the hospital, the, the, the cardiac cast, have a Google Glass, clear Google Glass in there, and you put them on, and you're looking at your catheterization, or the colonoscopy, or your well, he had, <laughs> I could watch, but he, he had to turn it toward me, it was turned away from well, this makes but, it easier. You know. Well, so I, I get one. How much are they? <laughs> well, they're not for sale yet oh. to the public. But they'll probably be a few hundred dollars, like a, like a smartphone would be. You know, like, no are one knows the price. Yeah. Well, no. uh, uh, again, it's a change of culture. I think that eventually, there's no reason why not. The hospital will have Google Glass that will be in the same uh, Wi-Fi network, just like we have iPads and tablets and that we give patients or kids on the pediatric floor so they can play and they can look at the results or, or uh, patients now can go on the internet and look at their medical record online. Oh, sure. uh, we can do that. So same thing with that. Aren't you uh, an anomaly a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to tell that. <laughs> <laughs> am I an anomaly? She said I'm an anomaly. Well, I am. I think I am. I, 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 because, yeah, because I, I, I feel that I am you know, disruptive. I, I'm a little bit... I think outside of the box, I think, and, and I'm a little bit proud of that, but I also jump outside of the box. And, 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 uh, and yeah, there is a group of, of, of physicians like, like me and healthcare people like me, and, and it's getting larger and larger because this is the future. And you know, you, you kind of preach about this, and you feel like, like an evangelist of, of, uh, of predicting what's going to happen. And, you know, people can hear you. See, when I first came here, I had done some robotic surgery training, and I do robotic surgery at East Maine. And I remember me and a urologist and a cardiac surgeon at East Maine, uh, uh, we were talking about robotic surgery. This is back in, in 2000 and, uh, 2005 or 2006. And uh, 
no one was going to provide a surgery back then. So we went to the board of EMHS in, in Brewer. And uh, uh, basically, they wanted to hear what this is robot. What is this robotic surgery stuff? Well, that's crazy. You know, every robot was about 1.2 million dollars. Still, they, they are about uh, actually 1.5 million dollars now. So uh, every one of us gave our presentation, and my, one of my lines that I remember was, you know, it's 1.2 million dollars, and you can do it now, or you can do it in five years from now behind Maine Medical Center and behind, you know, other hospitals. They chose to do it then, and now we have one of the top programs in the nation for robotic surgery. Really? We have we have two robots all the time, and we sometimes release a third robot. So if they hadn't taken that decision back then and spent the 1.2 million dollars, where would that be? They, they, they would be behind all the other hospitals in the country, yeah. or in the or in the, or in the state. Even. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. it takes a culture change, and I think you have to be a disruptor and an innovator and. And yeah, I, I you know I am a full time surgeon, and I this is I do this on my on my time off, on my alter life in a way, I, 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 a little bit aside of my role as instrument. I'm not a I'm not a, 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 I guess a, a, an instrument employer right now. I'm just talking for myself. The instrument is not advocating doing you know medicine with a Google Glass, and and they are embracing a little bit because I've been pushing a lot. And have, I have a machete at home with that. I, I, <laughs> but uh, you know, it will happen no matter what. Can't stop progress. Yes. Well, that's a great question. So, in in Maine and in 29 states in the union. Telemedicine consoles are built the same as physical consoles. As long as you meet the right criteria, for many years now, regular telemedicine consoles, we build the same. If I see you in the ER in, you know, Calais for an emergent consultation, and I dictate a consult, and you have a registration number, you, I bill for a consultation as if I was there personally. So, uh, yeah, it's it's mandated by the government or private insurance. They need to. They must. Yeah. So, yes. So, um, you in the beginning said there were like 17 hospitals that are connected. In May, in, in, in Eastern May. Maine, Eastern Maine Health, we have 17 hospitals in our network. Okay, so I travel a lot. So, where should I be going to go? <laughs> <laughs> I've got good care in case I go hit a moose. Eastern Maine wants to me to tell you do not go south. <laughs> so, we're talking north of I no, we have uh, uh, all the north and east and west. You know, <coughs> imagine seven. Uh, pretty much every uh, caribou doesn't have telemedicine, and Forken doesn't have, but will have very soon. Okay. So any other hospital, but we have a very tight relationship with any other other hospitals, even if they don't have telemedicine, because because the, there are no other hospitals in yeah, there. Yeah. So. Yeah. One time for one more question. Okay. From the lab. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the main seacoast mission. The Bar Harbor has a boat, and they uh -huh. visit the yep. offshore islands. Yep. They have a nurse on board, and they yep. have pet telemedicine. Do you know if you, if the, uh, we, we're, if we are not help, helping them at all? No, we are not part of them uh, because they do have their program. They've been doing it for many years. Mm -hmm. It would be great if they would oh. integrate that to us, and that's something we've talked about. Yes. And they have a great system, and you know, it's not used very frequently. But it doesn't cost anything to join. It's yeah. really, especially as technology advances, it's very easy to, to, to connect. To, so that's something that in the future will certainly happen. Right? Okay, well, thank Great. you so much. No, my thank pleasure. You. Thank you.